Hi, I'm Manika Raman-Wilms, and you're listening to The Decibel from The Globe and Mail. This month, several women testified before the Senate's Human Rights Committee. I was sterilized against my will when I was 29 years old. They were talking about how they were coerced into being sterilized in Canadian hospitals. I have six children and 14 grandchildren, and I am also an Indian day school survivor. My parents and late husband are residential school survivors. Having a big family was my dream. All these women are Indigenous. My name is Sylvia Tuckenau, and I am a 49-year-old free woman from Papikasi's First Nation in Saskatchewan. You're about to hear a part of this testimony, but I want to warn you that it's a graphic description of what happened. So please take care. On July 9, 2001, I went to Royal University Hospital in Saskatoon in active labor. I gave birth to a healthy baby boy with my late husband by my side. Shortly after the birth, I heard my husband in the hall saying loudly to nurses, I'm not I'm not signing that. No one asked me anything or explained anything to me about what he'd been asked. And I'm absolutely sure that I didn't sign anything. As soon as my husband left the hospital, I was taken into an elevator in a wheelchair to another room. I felt terror and fear as I was taken into that room. A few nurses surrounded me. I don't know exactly how many nurses to prepare me for an epidural. During this, I kept saying, no, I don't want to do this, and crying uncontrollably, but nobody listened to me. I was completely ignored by everyone in that room. I was so vulnerable because my legs weren't working properly because of giving birth and having the first epidural. I kept crying, and I was terrified. I was hyperventilating because of the position I was I was in on that bed. My head was positioned lower than my body and they tied me down to the bed. I, I also could smell something burning, which reminds me of the smell of uh, singed chickens to this day. I asked the man doing the surgery if he was done a few times. He didn't reply until the procedure was done. <clears throat> When he was finished, he said, There, tied, cut, and burnt. Nothing will get through that. This terrifying experience left a void inside of me. I felt no longer a woman, and I am terrified of hospitals and doctors. And that's why it's so important to hear these women at the Senate Standing Committee on Human Rights. Because you can read about it, but until you hear those voices... You don't feel it in your heart. That last voice you just heard was Senator Yvonne Boyer. She's a member of the Standing Senate Committee on Human Rights, which is where Sylvia shared her story. Senator Boyer is also a member of the Métis Nation of Ontario. She's been a lawyer and a nurse, and she's been speaking out for years against forced sterilization in Canada. She's on the show today to tell us about that fight. This is The Decibel. Senator Boyer, it's it's great to have you here. Thank you so much for speaking with us. Well, thank you. I I appreciate the opportunity. So we heard just off the top there from from Sylvia Tuckenau, who who shared her story about being forcibly sterilized. What was your reaction when you first heard her story? Um, I met Sylvia a number of years ago, and uh, I had heard her story then, and uh, I I will tell you how I prepared for hearing stories like Sylvia's and others Mm -hmm. is that I had an elder with me named Mary Lee and I had Dr. Judy Bartlett who was my co-author. We worked together on the project of the external review of the tubal ligation policies of the Saskatoon Health Authority and every morning we held hands and we prayed and we asked the creator for strength to help us help these women tell their story. It was a very, very powerful experience because the the trauma that these women underwent, and Sylvia 
is very good at describing the trauma that she underwent. But the words that come out are words. What we felt in that room was beyond words. It was sacred. Senator, can I ask, when when we say that someone has been sterilized, coerced or forced into sterilization, what does that really mean? What's your understanding of why, why would a doctor do this? Because they're making a judgment call on the ability of that woman to have children, her parent, her parenting skills. Uh, she's indigenous, so she therefore is lesser than and can't possibly meet my standards. This is what's happened with the, say, the 60s scoop. Same thing. Sterilization is a symptom of racism, discrimination systemically. And, and why is it happening to Indigenous women? Because we are at the bottom of the social strata. From the people you've talked to, I mean, do you have a sense of, of really how many, how many women are out there who've had to face this? Okay, so here's a, a typical, for instance, I'm speaking in northern Manitoba or northern Saskatchewan. I'm speaking in a community hall. When I'm finished speaking, I have people lined up all the way out to the door and out around the corner to talk to me. Over 200 people that talked to me on that trip had been sterilized. That is just right out of the blue. I happen to go up into their community. Those numbers are, we have no idea really then, is what you're saying. We have no, no idea how no. many people are have had to go through this. That's exactly right. My office is in the process of putting numbers together. And from the work that we've done, we have in the thousands. As, as far as we know, is, is this still happening now? Yes. Monday night, we heard from a young woman, Witness A, and she's 28 years old. She was sterilized four years ago and she had two children. 2018, she was sterilized. Yes, I can guarantee at this very moment it's happening. Something I want to tell you about one of the witnesses, it was uh, Nicole Rabbit. And it was very heart-wrenching because her mother has been sterilized. And by Nicole being sterilized and, and others in Nicole's age group, and even in her mother's age group, is there isn't enough people in the blood tribe. There isn't enough people that come forward to take care of the elders. And it's disrupted the natural flow of creation. It's not just disrupted one person, it's disrupted future generations and future generations of treaty right holders and inherent right holders and Section 35 holders. The enormity of what is happening cannot be minimized. Thinking about the way that you're saying this is impacting these communities, then would like would you consider this a form of, of, of genocide? Absolutely. And this is an issue that, uh, that you yourself have been working on for some time. When did you first start hearing about incidents like this happening? Well, I'm going to go back to uh, as a child and living with my aunt and uh, her life in a tuberculosis sanatorium and the fact that she wanted to have children. I don't know if she was sterilized. I have never been able to access her records. She was in the tuberculosis sanatorium for 10 years and five years in a body cast. So... And she also talked to me about the monsters that walk the halls. So if you can imagine a tiny little Chippewa girl, little brown skinned girl in a, in a big institution laying on her back for 10 years, how vulnerable she would have been. So I, I believe she was probably sterilized. When I first heard or the, or the concept was more solidified in, in a practical term, was when I was nursing, when I was at the hospital. I was a nurse before I was a lawyer. And on more than one occasion, the coffee chatter in the coffee room, people would say to me and to just generally everyone that the only way we're going to fix the Indian problem is if we sterilize the women. Good. And and they said that to me because they thought I was like them, but they were talking about my sisters and my aunties and my family and possibly me. 
I mean, I'm, I'm light skinned, but they didn't know who they were talking to. And that was the beginning of the anger setting in, understanding about how deep racism is in the healthcare system. And it solidified what I needed to do next. So my next steps were going to law school. And then I received a call from Betty Ann Adam of the Star Phoenix in about 2015. So Betty Ann uh, said, I have two women with me and they're indigenous. And they said that they've been sterilized in the Saskatoon hospital. Mm -hmm. And I said, what? How can that be? That's a criminal act. It's an assault. It's an assault on their bodily integrity. It's an assault on their right to reproduce. It's a constitutionally protected right. It's a charter right that's against international law. And so she published the first story about two women that came forward. And I always say their names because they were the first women, Tracy Benab and Brenda Palshay. They were the heroes because when they they had their voices out. It was now out in the open. Another woman came forward and said, I join you. And then another woman came forward and another and another and another and another. Pretty soon there was 11 women. So then this led to your 2017 report uh, that you co-authored with Dr. Judith Bartlett. And, and that review looked at coerced tubal ligation in Saskatoon. And coerced tubal ligation is, is actually the procedure that, that sterilizes women. How did you get women who had undergone this procedure to, to come forward and speak to you? So we engaged with, with uh, women that had been sterilized. We put notices up in places that they would be visiting in Cree and in English. I believe that Dr. Bartlett and I were merely conduits, only conduits. And we were able to get the women's voices out through that report. It sounds like the way that this was approached is, as you say, really not just centering these women's voices, but really just making sure that they were they were the core of this. Um, and that's maybe something that has not happened before. That's right. That's correct. And that's why it's so important to hear these women at the Senate Standing Committee on Human Rights, because you can read about it, but until you hear those voices, you don't feel it in your heart. What is the impact of all of these issues on, on the quality of care, really, that Indigenous women receive when they try to access health care in Canada? So what we see as a result for all of these women is they're not going to access health care. They're not going to go for their pap smears. They're not going to take their kids into for health care treatment. And, and they're going to suffer. And the generations after them are going to suffer. Their families will suffer because of what's happened to them. The sterilization might be an act on an individual, but it affects a community. It affects a family, it affects a community, and it affects a nation. Yeah, so, I mean, let's... let's talk about, I guess, some solutions here, if we can use that term. Uh, one proposed solution has been to change the language in the criminal code to specifically ban this practice of, of forced or coerced sterilization. The government, though, has said in the past that this isn't necessary because there's already language in the criminal code that would make these procedures illegal. So if that's true, why aren't we seeing criminal cases into these allegations? So we have a huge mistrust. So they're not going to call the police when this has happened. That's for sure. Using what we have now has not worked or we wouldn't have women that are sterilized. But I have always said, I know that the, there's, there's people that are calling for the criminalization of this and I have resisted that. But I'm getting to a point where I may not resist it much longer. Why have, you res why have you resisted it before? Because of the danger of opening up the criminal code and having it turned against Indigenous people. So as a lawyer, I am, I am assessing, is this a good thing to do or not a good thing to do? And I'm not sure how, how I'm going to come up with the right answer, but I am looking at it. I am looking at that because so much more needs to be done. Can we look at the big the big picture here, Senator? I, looking at the issue of, of forced sterilization, how does how does this fit into 
the the national conversation that that we're having about truth and, and reconciliation here? Well, um, actually, I can fit it into reconciliation because what we're doing today is a form of reconciliation. Hmm. I'm getting my voice out there. You are helping that voice travel because somebody's going to hear me that's going to say it happened to me and they're going to call me and they're going to leave a voicemail and I'm going to call them back and I'm going to talk to them and I'm going to find them help. So that is a form of reconciliation. Senator, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you. I appreciate being here. That's it for today. I'm Manika raman Wilms. Our intern is Emily McPhail. Our producers are Madeline White, Cheryl Sutherland, and Rachel Levy-McLaughlin. David Crosby edits the show. Kasia Mihailovich is our senior producer, and Angela Pachenza is our executive editor. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll talk to you next week.